All right, if you take your Bibles and open to the book of Hebrews, we began our series in the book of Hebrews last week, and we got through the first four verses of chapter one. This morning, we're going to begin in Hebrews 1, verse 5, and read through the end of the chapter. The scripture says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father, or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. When he again brings his firstborn into the world, he says, And all God's angels must worship him. And about the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. But to the Son, your throne, God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy rather than your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you established the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like wear out like clothing, you will roll them up like a cloak, and they will be changed like a robe. But you are the same, and your years will never end. Now to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? If you haven't noticed already, there's an incredible emphasis on the Messiah here in the book of Hebrews. Last week, as we looked at the beginning of Hebrews, the Lord says, it says, long ago God spoke to our fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became higher in rank than the angels, just as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. Now, we spent a lot of time last week looking at and unpacking some of those four verses. But what an incredible introduction for us to think about and meditate on our Messiah. Now, the Lord makes this comparison here specifically to angels, right? Um, And he's writing to Hebrews. Now, Hebrews as a group of people would be defined as a very religious group of people. Okay, when you grow up in a, we'll call it church, in their case synagogue, but when you grow up and this is what your family does, okay, everybody, whether you have faith in God's word or not, knows the same things. As a matter of fact, I went to, I went to college and to seminary in the South And uh, you cannot go witness to people in the South in public because everybody's a Christian. Everybody loves Jesus. Now, do they all follow Jesus by faith? Absolutely not. But if you go and you're like, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. man. I I grew up up going to church. I know all about Jesus. We, We are good. In other words, in other words, that's a polite way of saying don't talk to me anymore. I got to go. Right, But this would be the nation of the Hebrews is that everybody knew religion. Everybody knew about scripture. So guess what? As a result, everybody has a belief in the supernatural. Okay? And if you believe in the supernatural, what's one of the really fun things to debate, discuss, slash talk about? Angels. I mean, after all... God created them, they are real, we can't see them, and they have unique powers and special abilities. I mean, what a cool conversation to have. And so the Lord here is highlighting that while angels are real, while they are cool created things, they only serve the Messiah. So if I could paraphrase this for you, don't waste, your, don't waste too much of your time focusing on angels. They're under authority, just like you. 
God's point here is to focus on the Messiah. So here he says, he says, you are my son. And I want to get you, when he, when he quotes the scripture, I want to show you where these scriptures come from. For he says, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. That is a quote from Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7. The Lord says, I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like pottery. Then he goes on and he says, or again, uh, I will be his father and he will be my son, which is also referencing uh, Psalm 2, 7 and 8. Psalm, uh, when he goes on, he says, uh, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, and all God's angels must worship him. Psalm 97, 7 says, who, all who serve carved images, those who boast in idols will be put to shame. All God's angels must worship him. And then he goes on and he says, and about the angels, he said, he makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. Um, he makes his angels winds, comes from Psalm 104, 4. He says, he, and, makes, and making the winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. By the way, in the, uh, uh, in the Greek, the word for angel is the same word for wind or breath. Or can be used, I'm sorry, can be used. Not the same word, but can be used as a reference point. So wind can refer to angels, breath can refer to angels because they, they, they exist but you can't see them. Wind, breath, anyway, they're interchangeable um, in the Greek and Hebrew. The, the, the references, I'm sorry, not the words, the references are interchangeable. The making his winds, messengers, flames of fire, his servants. But then he goes on and he says, but to the sun he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever and this and." Uh, and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy rather than your companions. Right? Your throne, O God. Psalm 45, verse 6 says, Your throne, God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy rather than your companions. And then it says in verse 10 and the, of, of, of Hebrews 1, In the beginning, Lord, you established the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like clothing. You will roll them up like a cloak, and they will be changed like a robe. But you are the same, and your years will never end. This comes from Psalm 107, verse 25. It says, Long ago you established the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish but you will endure all of them you will wear all of them will wear out like clothing you will change them like a garment and they will pass away but you are the same and your years will never end and then he says verse 13 now to which the angels has he ever said sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool Psalm 110 verse 1 says this is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool so here we see that the Lord is simply quoting from Scripture. But what I find interesting is that he's, he's highlighting this reference is the Messiah. It's referencing Jesus Christ. All of this that is, that is being quoted from the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. So Jesus is the emphasis. The Messiah is the emphasis. Um, now I'm going to share with you where I think you and I should take this. But I want to highlight real quick here some places that we, that we take... We allow our imaginations or our insatiable curiosity to take us that don't necessarily line up with God's emphasis here in Hebrews 1, okay? Because maybe you're like me and you find yourself in the realm of like, well, I haven't really spent that much time on angels. I could see the fascination. I know people that have done a lot of study, research, teaching, whatever, but it just doesn't really strike me as like this, this great thing. It's just, it's okay, All right? It, right? And maybe you're one of those people that you're like, oh my goodness, you mean I shouldn't have spent like half of my life looking at angels? Okay, well, all right. Take God's point and regular, okay, focus more on the Messiah. But maybe you're more like me and instead of focusing on angels... You find yourself wanting to focus on literally anything spiritual except Jesus. Why? Because when I expand my knowledge and understanding, I feel good. 
When I can properly understand how to debate somebody and, and process what they're trying to tell me. Yeah, it's just a nice place to be, isn't it? You know, when I can say, man, I have heard every sermon by this phenomenal gospel focused Bible centered preacher. Tell you what, feels good. It's a nice pat on the back. But what happens to my pride when I put my focus by faith on the Messiah, on Jesus Christ? I don't really come out looking that great. Is it a wonder then that I find myself attracted to literally every other spiritual conversation except for focusing on Jesus? No, it's not a wonder. It's pretty logical. It's pretty normal. But the, here's, the, here's what I think the Lord's trying to tell us. You're wasting your time. We are wasting our time. Because at the end of the day, everything that's not about Jesus puts us in the driver's seat. So what should we do in focusing on Jesus? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Let's see what the scripture has to say. Revelation 5 says this in verse 9. It says, And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, blessing and honor and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Revelation says this in, verse, in chapter 15, verse 3. It says, They sang the song of God's servant Moses and the song of the Lamb. Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name, because you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you because your righteous acts have been revealed. Revelation 12 says this in verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah have now come because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown out, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives in the face of death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great fury, because he knows he has a short time. So then what should we do in focusing on the Messiah? Let me make it really simple. Oh wait, Jesus already did. Look at John chapter 4, verse 21. He says, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain in, nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do, do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But... An hour is coming and now and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. Now we're here in church on Sunday 
And if we're being honest, there's maybe a few of us that are here and because there's the Mother's Day attached to it and makes us feel a little bit better to be with mom. All right. Not a big deal. We all come, we go, hey, I get to praise God. This is nice. I enjoy worshiping God in church. I, I love the time. I love the worship. I, I really feel so thankful and full and appreciative. And I just, I, it's just great. And you know what? I really want to come back again because it was so beneficial and I loved it. And I just, such a blessing. Then why do we stop worshiping God when we walk out of church? Why do we put the attention, and by the way, I, I say we, because even though a past, I'm a pastor, I do the exact same thing. I walk out of, it's like, all right, now what's next for me? Usually it's, what, what am I going to put in my belly quickly? Right? But all of a sudden, that great moment, great time, great focus on the Lord, now I'm back on me, and guess how I feel almost immediately? I feel as bad as I did before I went to church. And it's like, well, that was a great moment in my week, but now the rest of the week is just, ugh, ugh, oh. Is it not a wonder that we can sit next to somebody having a great time worshiping God and get in the car and be grumpy at the same person? Because the focus is on me. Now here's what the Lord says in Romans chapter 3 verse 21. It says, but now, apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. That is God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay. You ready for this great and powerful, like, wow moment? You know how to get in the car and not be grumpy? Sit down in Jesus' righteousness. When someone tells you that you don't measure up, Jesus declares me righteous. I don't have to meet your standard. I don't need to submit to your opinion of my failure or what you think I should be or should be doing. I've been declared righteous. I can be at peace. You might be in turmoil, but I don't have to live in turmoil. You want to know why? I've been declared righteous. Some of you have had the opportunity in your life to be in a courtroom when you're on the hot seat. I don't mean the witness stand. I mean the are you in trouble or not seat. Okay? All right? Um, the closest I ever came to that seat was when I went to traffic court and I realized very painfully there's no way out of the wrong seat. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, you know that feeling you get when you are told by the judge you're free to go? <sighs> Unbelievable peace in that moment. I'm walking out of here, I'm free. You can't take my day down. I've just been told I ain't being taken to jail. Woo! 
I'm not being hit with a big fine. Woohoo! Free to go. In God's court, you are forever declared free. But you want to know why people get me down? Because I don't think about what God says of me. I don't stay focused on the Messiah and what he does for me. I start thinking about what I want and how I want to look and how I want people to treat me and how I think I should have life and all these things that, oh, I, 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 and it takes absolutely no time at all before Sunday afternoon, I'm emotionally in a very bad place going, oh, oh, I can't believe tomorrow's Monday. So what does the Lord want us to do? Romans 12 says this. It says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. God wants you to continue to worship Him because of what He's done for you. You want to have God's peace in you at all times, no matter what you're doing, then follow what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for God's glory. God created us as worshipful beings. We always are worshiping something. But you want to know the real problem that we all deal with that we don't like to think about? I want worship to come this way. My way. I want people to agree with me. I want people to to understand me. I want people to like me. I want people to promote me. I want people to under... On and on and on. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a funny story about me having being corrected on this way of thinking, okay? When Rachel and I were in pre-marriage counseling, we had a wonderful man who was a, such a blessing to us. His name was Dr. Cruz. He'd go, it's just like juice, but with a C-R, Cruz. Okay. Uh, he said, that's how you spell it. Well, anyway, wonderful, godly man. We were so blessed by him. And uh, one day, we happened to go into our pre-marriage counseling, having just had a disagreement. And we walked in with smiles on, but very emotionally not connected. And uh, so he kind of sensed something was a little bit different, a little bit off. So he asked some probing questions, found out, okay, a little bit of what, was, what the argument was. And so he starts, he says, Steve, I'm going to start with you. I'm like, okay. So he says, all right, so if I hear what you're saying about this argument, this is what you're thinking, and this, I'm like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, yeah, okay. Frankly, the argument was so important, I can't even remember what it was about. Okay, that's how valuable it was. But uh, he says, all right, so this, I I said, yeah, you you got the right picture, that's what we're talking about, that's what I'm saying. He goes, okay. He goes, let me ask a couple questions. He goes, do you respect Rachel? I said, yeah. He said, do you you, uh, think that, that she... Uh, has really valu- a valuable way of thinking and understanding things. I'm like, oh yeah. He goes, do you uh, want her influence in your life? I said, well, yeah, absolutely. He goes, then you're an idiot. <laughs> Sorry? He goes, because what you just told me was you wanted her to stop thinking her way and agree with your way. Oh. <laughs> Do you know that we do that to God and to those around us all the time? And the real problem is the direction of the worship. If I'm focused on worshiping God, then what I really want is His way. What I really want for others is what He says. Which means what they say about what I say matters very little. So little, there's no reason to get upset by it.
I'm going to jump ahead in Hebrews for a moment. We'll get there to discuss this eventually. But we'll look with me, if you will, at Hebrews 11, verse 6. It says, Now without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, hold on one second. If God had only made that statement and stopped right there, don't read ahead. Hey, listen for a second. We're going to get there. But if God had only made that statement, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. All right, God, I got it. Then everything I do, I'm going to do with a level of faith because I'm pleasing you. Right? Isn't that how we would think? God, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do to please you. But God does not stop there because God wants our faith to be directed in a very specific, with a very specific focus. He says, for the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. The faith that pleases God is focused on on him all right are you ready for me to wrap this up okay good we leave church we go and focus on our moms some of us we feel fairly good if you don't have a mom you feel pretty bad Okay, if your mom's passed on, you're like, oh my goodness, I hate this. Okay, but we leave church, we go, we have a focus on our moms. Either we feel really good or really bad, depending on our circumstances, okay? Sometimes it's a little bit of both, all right? And uh, we finish that up. We have our plans for Sunday night. We accomplish our plans for Sunday night. We have our plans for Monday morning. We wake up, we start our plans for Monday morning. How do we focus on the Lord? How do we worship Him? How do we keep from winding up in the same miserable, uncomfortable, unlovable, unfavorable state that we find ourselves in every day of our lives? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for God's glory. Hebrews eleven six. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God for the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. Now, some of you are going to be like, uh, Steve, are you saying that I got to read my Bible like all the time. Um, No. The Pharisees read their Bible all the time and it did them no good because they didn't read it by faith, looking to worship the one who wrote it by faith. But I am saying this, if you put your mind's attention on worshiping the Lord, you will always be fulfilled because that's the purpose for which you were created. You will always have peace because you'll be focusing on what the Messiah says and what he wants. You'll be wanting his thoughts to influence you more than the television preacher or the radio preacher or the great blog post or the great vlog or whatever. You'll be looking for what he says and what he wants. And you'll understand what it means to live Romans 12, which says... Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your rational service or spiritual worship could be translated accurately either way. In short, this life of faith is hard. It's the opposite of what we naturally want to do. But if we want the peace of God, which passes all understanding, to keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, then we will do what the Lord has done here in the beginning of Hebrews, which is to focus all of the attention on Jesus Christ because he is worthy of it.
If you're like Steve, I think I'm going to fail. Welcome to the club. You're in a good place. We're all going to fail. The question is, what are you going to do after you fail? You're going to continue to living in, living in failure or are you going to say, you know what, Lord, I really want my focus to be on you. I really want the peace that you're going to bring. I want the hope that comes from worshiping you. It doesn't have to be singing all the time. But you want to know something kind of funny? When I'm in the car riding by myself and I don't have music playing, you know, it's actually kind of awkward to open my mouth and start praising the Lord in song when I'm all by myself in the car. You want to know why? Because it's an act of faith. It's an act of faith to say that, God, you're actually listening. To say, God, you actually want me to praise you. To take a moment and pretend that God is actually sitting in the passenger seat next to me, even though he's sitting with me in the driver's seat. He's sitting right there wanting me to talk to him. Do you know the hardest thing to do is to open my mouth and actually talk to him instead of asking him for everything? Because it's an act of faith. God wants us to walk by faith seeking him and guess what he says he says that he, what he said we just read it in hebrews 11 right he says um that he rewards those who seek him let us choose the the path of faith so that we might be rewarded let's close in prayer heavenly father we're thankful for the power of your truth and we're thankful for the emphasis here in Hebrews, to focus our hearts and minds on you. Lord, please give us that mustard seed of faith, that tiny bit of faith that you know that that we are lacking. Or Lord, you know that we, we fail epically every week. But Lord, give us just enough faith that we might be able to focus our hearts and minds on you and choose to worship you as we are, we are going. May we, as we worship you, may we see your thoughts as being higher and more valuable than ours. And may we seek to encourage those who are around us to place the same value on knowing you and on knowing your thoughts, Lord, because we have, we have benefited personally so greatly from worshiping you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.